Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Conversations at the Culver. Um, I am so happy that you're here today for this. We have a wonderful talk ahead of us. The Poets Laureate, several from the region here, are here to discuss rewriting the narrative, fighting erasure, and forging a future. Um, with this panel of esteemed Poets Laureate, moderated by James Coates, and he's going to introduce everyone else in a minute. But I'm going to start um, by telling you who I am. I'm Janine Peroy Gamblin, and I am the Programs Coordinator for Inlandia Institute, which is a literary and cultural arts nonprofit here in Southern California. Yay, Amy, she got it up. Whoop. Oh, I spoke too soon, but you'll be, you'll get it. <laughs> um, you may have noticed Hong Mi Basrai. She's out manning the table in the uh, gallery. She, we recently had an event for her book. She wrote a book called Behind the Red Curtain about her family surviving and eventually escaping after Saigon fell. Um, we had an event for her recently. And then Kimmy Palacios. Say hello, Kimmy. There she is here running the live stream. We will be having this um, live on Facebook, but also later on it'll be on our YouTube channel. We want to thank UCR Arts and the splendid Amy Metcalf, who's hurrying away, uh, for all their help. So before we go any further, I'd like to say a few words. Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Thank you. I've got to turn my page. We do have some light refreshments out in the gallery when we're finished, and we do have some poetry books on sale, for sale from the poets here. Uh, if you have cash, we're having trouble with our terminal, so we would love it if you had cash today. Cash always loves it. Yes. <laughs> um, our moderator is the fabulous Mr. James Coates right here. He's a multidisciplinary artist, author, and educator, born in Los Angeles and raised in the Inland Empire. As a creative change agent, he believes the arts can inspire the youth and influence positive change in the world. He is the winner of the 2021 San Gabriel Poetry Slam. In 2021, he founded the organization Lift Our Voices Education, which hosts an award-winning workshop um, monthly called Be the Change. It's about social justice writing. He became the artist in residence at the Garcia Center. And his newest poetry collection, Midnight and Mad Dreams, is published by World Stage Press. We have some copies outside this room. Um, and you can find more about him on Instagram at Mr. Loving Words. And so let's give a hand to this esteemed panel. And Thank you uh, so much for that. And, and thank Inlandia for um, being a supporter with these events and having these um, uh, conversations and creating space for these conversations to happen amongst poets and uh, uh, speaking of the community out here at Riverside. And so I want to get into uh, who I have here on the panel. Um, Right here to my left, we'll start with uh, Antonio Edwards. Uh, motivational speaker, writer, and spoken word poet Antonio Edwards Jr. provides audiences with powerful spoken word presentations customized to inspire and energize any event. When he is not performing, Antonio is busy developing teaching methods to help young poets find their literary voice and use language poetry provide to develop their own form of self-expression and self-actualization. An explosive performer of the written word, Antonio's spoken word pieces are charged with rhyme, rhythm, wordplay, and verbal assaults that will not just sit on paper. That's true, I've seen it. <laughs> Known as the people's poet, Antonio was named Tacoma Washington's Poet Laureate 
2019. To his left, we have Dr. Natalie J. Graham, is a award winning author and performer who has toured nationally with a collection of poems, Begin with the Failed Body. In August 2021, Natalie was appointed Poet Laureate of Orange County. Is that inaugural? Mm -hmm. Inaugural Poet Laureate. Orange County, uh, a widely published scholar with research interests in race, identity, performance, and music. She is also a professor in the Department of African American Studies at Cal State University. When she isn't making poems, teaching, or planning events, she loves perfecting her chocolate chip baking, <laughs> cookie baking skills, and learning about science with her son, Ronald. Uh, I, I've seen the chocolate chip recipe. Uh, and to Natalie's uh, left, we have Peter J. Harris, Altadena Poet Laureate, Editor-in-Chief uh, from 2021 to 2024, is the author of Safe Arms, 20 Love and Erotic Poems with a Ooh, Baby, Baby Moan, <laughs> with Spanish translations by Franco Letelier. Uh, from Flower Song Press and Song Again by Beyond Baroque Books. In 2015, his book of poetry, Less the Ashes by Tia Chucha Press won the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award. And his book of personal essays, The Black Man of Happiness in Pursuit of My Unalienable Right won the American Book Award. Harris is a founding director of the Black Man of Happiness Project, a creative, intellectual, and artistic exploration of Black man and joy. He writes the blog, Reeking Happiness, a Joyful Living Journal. Uh, you can find more information at www.inspirationcrib.com. Thank you all for being here today to join in this important conversation talking about um, you know, the position of Poet Laureate and um, also current events and what poets are facing now today and, and the activities going on in the literary world. And so uh, for those of you that may be listening uh, online or viewing this later, there is, um, you may not be familiar with like what a, Poet Laureate is, or what a Poet Laureate does. Uh, essentially, the Poet Laureate position is um, a, a position to help elevate writing and reading of poetry within communities. Some of them are um, set up by organizations, and some are set up by cities, counties, uh, even the state, and also nationally we have a U.S. Poet Laureate as well. Uh, but to jump into the conversation, I would like to start with what um, being a Poet Laureate or what you believe being a Poet Laureate means to each one of you. So, um, no order. <laughs> if you got a, a thought on it, you can jump in. Uh, well, uh, to me, it is the hardest volunteer job I've ever had. Um, in Altadena, uh, we've had um, nine, I believe, nine uh, previous uh, laureates. Um, I'm happy to say that when we launched our season in August, uh, myself and my co-laureate, her name is Carla Samoth, we called back into the room all the living former laureates uh, from Altadena, except for one. We couldn't find one person, uh, and we still haven't found it. We have no idea. And for me, it was super important to begin that way, and, and, and frankly, so we're a collaborative team, uh, you know, but I come, I come with a lot more experience as a poet in the Los Angeles region and I come with a real, real kind of mission with this stuff. So I told uh, Carla, look, let's, let's get the people together who have done this work before. 
Um, everybody showed up. Everybody read a poem. And my stance has been uh, since then is wherever we can, we're trying to keep uh, the connection sort of with the DNA of the laureates uh, who came before us. Um, for me also, just personally, so I, you have to apply for the gig in Altadena. I did it as much as a, uh, an exercise uh, as, as it, I frankly didn't know if I would get it. I really didn't care. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. So, but it, it was an exercise and I decided that I, 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 since I landed in Altadena after some difficult personal times, I lost my house to foreclosure and I wasn't ready to leave LA and I wound up in Altadena. And the library there wound up being a second home and the staff at the library also, not only being, uh, were they polite and courteous and professional, they actually helped me jumpstart a project related to the Black Man of Happiness. Um, and that's, a, that's a, one of the librarians joined me in researching uh, historical uh, photos of Black men and boys emanating a sense of joy. And in fact, she coined that term, emanating a sense of joy. I give her credit, her name is Helen Kate. So I guess I'll say, just to make sure you're clear, uh, it's hard work doing this stuff. Uh, for us, uh, myself and Ms. Samoth, we uh, chose, especially coming off of the pandemic and its lockdowns, we chose to begin our two-year term with a season, just like a theater might. So uh, once we kicked it off in, uh, our, in August with this real full out reading, we presented ourselves and our own work, the work by other uh, previous laureates. We had a program once a month, uh, except for December. We presented poets or we presented a workshop. It was all uh, at the venue. The, the venue was the same for everything at the, at the library. So we wanted to make the library our, our home base, uh, which made it free for everybody. Um, we have our last reading on Tuesday prior to our big culminating reading, which they call Poets and Cookies. No, sorry. Poetry and cookies. It's a long standing tradition in Altadena. And in that uh, event this year, uh, the 32 poets who wrote some 52 poems that were published in the online Altadena Poetry Review will be invited to read. And yes, there will be actual cookies. Uh, we're waiting on the checks for the vendors now. And so I'll just simply close at uh, of this point. So for me, even though Carl and I don't get paid, and frankly, I'm not happy about it. Uh, we're workers, and I made sure that the leadership at the library knows. We did increase the budget, and we made sure that every poet who came in got 200 bucks. Then we joined with the poets and writers who uh, added money to the pot. So I'm really happy to say that um, as we get ready to close out year one, so we've circulated uh, $4,000 among the poets in and around Altadena, the, the San Gabriel Valley in LA. And, <laughs> won't make me laugh, we paid everybody on the day of the gig. Oh. <laughs> so nobody left the building without getting paid. And as a poet who's been doing this a super long time, I cannot tell you how long folks like to pay poets. I don't know why they think it's fun that you pay your carpenters when they finish the finished work in your house. But I'm really proud to share some of these numbers with you uh, in addition to some of the more qualitative stuff. And as we talk more, I can get deeper into some of the more philosophical stuff guiding me as well. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, I know you mentioned the library as being like part of the journey. I think for a lot of poet laureates, that space serves as um, you know a bridge between their art and the community. And so libraries are, are hugely important. The, 
I, I remember listening to um, Louis J. Rodriguez talking about, you know, how important the library was when he was going through um, the challenges in his life and how the library, you know, kind of pretty much helped to save him by providing that, that safe space for, uh, for his art. Um, so thank you for, you know, bringing, bringing the importance of that up. Um, Natalie or Antonio? Yeah, I'll share. I think um, the two things that were really sticking out to me as Peter was talking is, is that idea of the importance of structure and sustainability around artistic, you know, building, artistic development. And I think for me, being the inaugural poet laureate for Orange County, it really does, it's been a work of saying, okay, how do you actually keep this running and, and it, the meaningfulness of it for me is, is is the possibility, right? Like to say like before there wasn't, I can't, it seems like a dream to me to think, well, at some point down the road, there might be a 10th poet laureate of Orange County and then what a celebration we'll have. Um, but I do think that it's vitally important to think through what that looks like and to invite all folks to the conversation to make it sustainable. And so I think that for me, thinking about it being in this role, it's really a lot of saying like, like let's imagine, now that we have it, let's imagine what it could be. Because being the first, it's like, people are like, so what do you wanna do? You right. wanna like use all the street names in a city and turn it into a poem? I'm like, not yet, but that's a great idea. Um, and so I think for me, it's really like open, the openness of possibility. And that's exciting. Um, also libraries, you both you know, mentioned libraries like, I, it has renewed my love for libraries. Like, there's nothing in the U.S. like a library. Like, you, there, it's like, I, I almost thought, oh, it's kind of like a church because it's a haven, but it's a better than a church in some ways because you don't have to dress up. Yeah. You don't have to, you know, stand up when they tell you to. You can just sit in a library and be. And you can't do that in a store. You can't do that in, you know, a school. You got, you know, libraries give you the opportunity to do what you want in those spaces. And so you get a chance, if you want to read, you can read, you can just sit, you can, some, some of them have cafes. And so there are all different ways that I feel like libraries have um, made themselves more relevant and meaningful, especially in the last two years. Like the, the programming across Orange County for the public libraries is just, it's phenomenal. Like every weekend there's a, a craft day, there's a you know, board games activity, there's, science with the kids there's a monthly activity when you read the books you get you know panda express or you get a, a hamburger like there's i mean there's nowhere else there's a just read a couple books and we'll give you a hamburger <laughs> it's just it's just really exciting to me to think about how central how central libraries are already structurally set up to be in our lives and so and like whether or not we engage with them in that way like, I think that's that's also what I think a laureate like allows us the possibility to rethink what is our relationship to our local library and how can we think of it as a vital space for us to engage, engage in. And if we think about it that way, how does that change like sort of everyone's orbit in that city? So I really, I really think that those are the two things that, that stand out to me as like just super um, special for me in this time. Yeah. The Libraries are awesome. It's one of the few places we have in our, you know, society where you can kind of just show up and be, and you know, if you want to write, you write. If you want to read, you read. Or you just you want to, you know, be in a, a quiet space indoors, maybe um, not necessarily alone, but with other people doing, you know, some sort of work uh, in progress. So, I think library. That's like a that's like an ultimate writer tip, like. Get in contact with your library. Get in contact with your librarians, because uh, they can help so much from like pointing you in the right direction to um, finding research or, or organizing events, and even you know usually there is a relationship with the poet laureate in that community um, where where the library helps uh, maybe select them or uh, is you have to go through the library for the application process sometimes. Um, Natalie or Antonio, could you tell us about maybe um, 
your experience with the application? I know uh, Peter said that he, he did apply. Uh, how did y'all end up in, you know, kind of the, the running proposal? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I applied. Uh, I was, uh, incidentally, it's 2009, Port Laureate of the city of Tacoma. And I um, uh, just kind of fell into it. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a free spirit, so I allow the universe to happen and I just jump on um, and good things happen as a result. Uh, at least uh, that's been my experience. Um, so the 2008 Port Laureate was announced and when I heard uh, who had won was a professor from uh, University of Puget Sound, I wrote a poem claiming the Poet Laureate position <laughs> for the following year. <laughs> And I became 2009's Poet Laureate. Huh? What was the title? Um, it, I don't think it had a title, but it was the the, the spirit behind it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I I put in the application. I I was uh, awarded Poet Laureate for writing a piece about gentrification, which was at the right time. Uh, at the time I wrote it, um, it spoke, and it was 15 years in the making. Uh, so I had watched the gentrification happen. I lived in the city for 28 years, and someone had told me about it 15 years prior to me writing the poem. And one day, the whole poem, I just I just vomited it out just in one sitting. And uh, it was just the right poem at the right time. I was named Port Laureate and uh, had to look up what the title was and uh, had to Google it because I was like, okay, because I have been writing and reciting poems uh, uh, for a long time. And uh, when I understood what the what I was charged with, I started to bridge communities because I, I lived in the hilltop, which was a predominantly black neighborhood. And the North End uh, had poetry events and, and venues that uh, performed poetry and, and supported writers. And so I was able to bridge that because being named Port Laureate, uh, the doors flew open. And with that title, uh, I was invited to, to speak at, at pretty much every uh, university there in Washington State. Uh, I spoke at uh, St. Martin's College, which had their first, uh, and they've been around for hundreds of years, had their first um, a Black History Month celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was able to, so that gave me the mission. The mission, you know, appeared, and I, I said, well, let me bridge these communities. And uh, uh, while, while I was Port Laureate, I, um, every day of the week, I found a venue to, to have uh, open mics uh, in the city. And so every day of the week was an open mic uh, somewhere in the city, uh, at a bookstore, at a coffee shop, somewhere, anywhere that, that they agreed to do it. Um, that was my mission. And so uh, I immediately, with that spirit of connecting, uh, I joined the uh, Tacoma um, uh, Arts Commission. Mm -hmm. And the first thing uh, a friend of mine, he says, Antonio, you don't want to join the Arts Commission, then you can't solicit them for money. <laughs> and I, I've never been money motivated. So I was like, I'm, so, I'm going to the Arts Commission so that I can tell my friends about the availability of money for the arts that's available in the city. Um, they paid, the Lord, Port Laureate paid $1,000, uh, and today they pay $5,000. Um, 4,000, a stipend for 4,000 and another thousand for a project. And I was like, wow, I wish that was when I was. Mm -hmm. So I, being the second Port Laureate of the city, uh, and then uh, Tammy Robacker was the third, with our, our efforts, uh, because it was an organization, actually a church, an urban church who uh, started the, the program, and the city took it over uh, as a result of what Bill, me, and Tammy did, the first three Port Laureates, and it became, you know, it became a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just so proud, and I just allowed uh, myself to do that, uh, to, to be in that spirit and in that space, and. Uh, uh, I just was going everywhere. I was getting calls like University of uh, uh, Washington State University, you know, and I was like, how did they know who I was, mm -hmm. right? Was like, you're the Port Laureate. And I was like, okay, so I would show up and uh, uh, 
my poetry is 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 you know uh, I'm real inspired by hip hop, so there's a lot of hip hop and a lot of uh, a word play in there uh, in the spirit of, of of rapping, but it was acapella, right? So I just and then uh, uh, with my uh, attending Evergreen State College, you know I was able to place the the academia in there and uh, my my love for history and and telling stories. So um, it literally changed my life, being named Port Laurier. Uh, I was on a different trajectory, and uh, it, puts, it put me on another trajectory, and I was able to to do that. So the application process, uh, I, uh, I applied for it. I sent in two poems, one of which was uh, Hilltopia, which was about, uh, and if I could say, uh, the hilltop of Tacoma, very, um, uh, infamous uh, part of town, uh, drugs, gangs, but I saw it differently. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to change the name of the city from the hilltop to Upper Tacoma mm -hmm. to change the negative connotation associated with the hilltop. So I changed the name from hilltop to Hilltopia. And it changed the whole connotation in the whole city. I even uh, cornered the mayor and recited the poem right to him and uh, uh, it started a whole movement. So, um, you know, I, I discovered how powerful words are. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was just a, a joy, a joy to do it. Uh, I was disappointed when it was over. I was like, oh, what am I gonna do now? But uh, it definitely opened the doors uh, uh, to, to do a lot more poetry, to write more, and to uh, uh, influence people with words. Yeah, it, it it really is like a labor of love position because, but as you mentioned, like it, there isn't a whole lot of like funds um, for the poet laureate, uh, maybe a little bit to, to do projects and stuff. But um, the comments you're making kind of leads us to the next question, which is, um, what projects have you worked on that you feel passionate about or um, you know brought you a lot of joy? I know. Um, Lynn Thompson, poet laureate of Los Angeles, put together the, the uh, reading uh, a poet, LA poets at the library out there, and it was it was a beautiful uh, event, and I know it, it made a lot of uh, poets happy to be seen and to be part of that. Um, what have you worked on, or what are you still working on that that brings you joy? I'll answer. Um, I, one of the things I'm working on, it'll be the poem I read later, is um, a series of love songs celebrating Black uh, female musicians. And so I think a lot about, um, especially, you know, our, our pop stars like Beyonce, Diana Ross, Whitney Houston, a lot of times they don't get their due as, like, they might be seen as icons, but they're not always seen as, like, the genius performers that they are. Like, I think it's a, it's very easy to kind of take them down um, and see them as sort of like glossy and pop. Yeah, um, yeah. and so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about writing um, songs to them. And part of the reason why I think this is also special is because um, the Libramobile and the Orange County Poet the Orange County Public Libraries were kind of in collaboration to put on this um, Poet Laureate position. Also, I was able to use funds from them to hire a digital artist to create, you know, a series of, of, of pictures of those women, just like kind of to go along with the poem. So I'm excited to have the, the visual art in conversation with um, the literary art and just kind of expand the conversation around those women. So I'm really excited about um, continuing to work on that. Sounds like that poem uh, Nikki Giovanni wrote for Aretha back in the day. Um, well, uh, in, in our case, um, the season was the, the major project because we wanted to encourage people to uh, sort of shake themselves up from the pandemic blues and come on and physically join, you know, join each other. Um, in a room together with accomplished poets. Um, the next year, what we have done, um, so if we get a grant that we've applied for, the big project will be called Ode to the Land. 
And so what we would do if we got money is, uh, uh, is to bring together elders and young people in workshop settings. And then we would do a reading series at iconic places, like literal places, parks. Uh, there's a new uh, a piece of land that was returned to an uh, indigenous community. So uh, what we want to do is just sort of literally root the poetry and root the readings on the ground. You know, uh, Altadena is in the foothills. So you can go from like, uh, you know, Eaton Canyon and, and, and if the rain, you know, who knows what will be happening next year, but there's a waterfall if you walk for it far enough uh, up, up the paths. Um, I mean, the, the second year, we also committed to producing an anthology. Um, so what we'll do is build on the work that's been submitted to the online uh, publication. It's called the Alzadina Poetry Review. Um, and then we'll do a printed copy. So we'll, we'll include most of those poems or we'll... I think what's evolving is... Um, uh, so, okay, so... So I should say two things. <clears throat> we banned open mics this year, and we will ban them next year. So I, unlike you, my friend, I, I've been to so many open mics where the people aren't ready to read that I decided that one of the sort of batch of specs that I wanted to put on the table is that if you uh, want to get better as a writer, sometimes that's woodshed time. So you don't have to be on the mic all the time. Um, and we've actually gotten pushback from that, including from a former laureate. But, you know, I told him up front, if you, if you chose me for this, you're getting ready to walk into some deep waters. Because I've been doing this. I, I keep saying that I've been doing this. This gray hair is not from half-stepping. This, this is well earned. But I love poetry and I love various traditions and I wanted to make sure with Carla, we, 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 everything we've done, we've agreed on. We may have debated it prior to deciding whatever we're gonna decide, but we everything we're doing, the review and how it's being operated, the, the series, et cetera, we've agreed on. So we, we told the community, we said, look, love the art form, not your poem. You know, love the community you're a part of. Come out and support it. Um, just because there's no open mic and you don't get to sling some poem you've had sitting around for years and you just want to be on the mic, um, doesn't mean that you can't learn something, that you shouldn't want to learn something. So this is a real point of view that I have, frankly. I. I you know, even I, I know Lynn Thompson, and she told us up front, one, just because I wrote you doesn't mean you're going to be in this big reading. You have to respond by a certain deadline and all that stuff. And she said, you only get to read one poem or two minutes, which means you don't get on the mic telling long <laughs> stories, sort of like what I'm doing now. But I'm the guest this time, so I guess I can play a little bit. But I, I think what's often missing, particularly in local settings, is an unwillingness by people who are in a, a gatekeeping or curatorial status to go ahead and gatekeep and go ahead and, secure, and curate. So I have no problem telling poets, get better by participating fully. You know, so if, if, if so we're bringing Vicky Vertiz and a Angela Pena Redondo tomorrow on Tuesday. These are two graduates of UC Riverside, MFA. I don't think you have to have an MFA to be a good poet. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying we're bringing into our community absolute master poets. These, this is the next generation of American poetry. They're like the Ada Limon level type bloods. I mean, they're really good. They do study. They teach. Well, now, <clears throat> why shouldn't you come and support them without having to get on the mic? You should come and learn from these masters. They're young masters. I learn, I go. They weren't even born when I published my first poem. And so 
the project vibration of Mr. Coates that, so we wanted to have structure. I love what you're saying. Um, but that structure also included exclusionary or sort of like, um, well, I guess I'll just call it a woodshed structure. You know, every poet doesn't get on a mic every time. Now, for me, that's, and in a robust poetic ecosystem like the Los Angeles, Southern California ecosystem, where it, so I'm in awe that you had an open mic. So I, I'm not anti open mic per se. And, and for your community, that might have been the most perfect way to do, to do what you're doing. And it might have reflected your temperament a little bit. I'm a little crankier <laughs> at this point in my life than it sounds like you are. So I said, no, we ain't doing that. And if you're mad, come to me directly. Most people won't come to me directly. So anyway, Uy, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I've experienced that. Um, and a lot of open mics, I'm sitting in the back cringing uh, because I'm like, you have this moment to be on the mic. You should take advantage of it. However, um, don't know when the next Amanda Gorman is going to be born, the next uh, spoken word artist is going to be born. And what I do when I perform, since I don't want to critique them, I perform, I'm teaching when I'm performing. I show them how to perform, how to enunciate their words and how to use their body and their eyes and, and to, to recite the poem in the passion that they wrote it in. And uh, I, I was fortunate to uh, get a contract with OMSD, Ontario Montclair School District, and uh, it was complete, it was completely, uh, so I was living in Tacoma and I was gonna move to Ontario. Uh, hadn't set foot in Ontario and a friend of mine, he says, um, you're moving to Ontario, you should look up Dr. Hammond. He's the superintendent of Ontario Montclair School District and he's from Tacoma or oh, from the area. And I was like, wow, that's great, thank you for that. I got to Ontario, forgot completely about Dr. Hammond. <laughs> So I went to an open mic. Uh, the, the, the gentleman who facilitated, facilitated the open mic uh, um, was from OMSD. And I didn't know this, so I, uh, I, I, I recited a couple poems and months later he calls me. He says, Antonio, uh, there's gonna be an open mic for a district, a school district, and you should come, because I heard your stuff. You're, you're, uh, he said I was kid friendly. And uh, I said, okay, so I showed up. And I performed, and as I'm walking off stage, the administrator, uh, her name was Ellen, Ellen Lugo, uh, approached me as I'm walking off the stage and offered me the contract to teach poetry at all 32 schools. And I was like, wow, thank you, thank you. And she said, by the way, didn't you just come from Tacoma? I said, yes. She, and she said, well, Dr. Hammond is our superintendent. <laughs> and I was like, thank you again. And and the rest is history. So I, I was able to teach poetry for three years as a contractor, going to all 32 schools. It was the best thing ever. I would leave those classes like floating mm -hmm. because uh, of the energy. Um, and I would use a format, I am from. And so the students was, you know, I am from whatever the, your favorite food, your favorite uh, places to go, your favorite people. So this one student, she said, I am from the ocean. And she just wrote this poem about being from the ocean. And I was like, just blown away. Another student, Luis, I'll never forget, seventh grader. He said, I am from pain and darkness. And he went on. I remember when he was done, I just gave him a hug, you know. And so I was able, and it just started to, uh, 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 and coming up uh, in April, we having our, I don't know, the what annual, 10th, 11th annual, maybe not that high up, but we having a, I've been uh, uh, facilitating or emceeing that that poetry event for OMSD uh, and teaching throughout the year. Uh, I'm now an employee of OMSD uh, as a mentor, but uh, my mentoring is always uh, is always poetic, pretty much uh, showing them self actualization, tell, you know, allowing them to speak. So that's what the open mics are to me. Uh, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm really like sometimes about it uh, but you never know what this student I mean I've, I've been amazed by so many students I, and I 
got ideas from them. I was like, I'm gonna put that in a poem, you know? <laughs> right? They say so profound things. And so that's what I like about it. So I kind of shift, you know, my tolerance level uh, to, and then I teach as I perform. When I perform, um, it's all of me. And I, I'm hoping that they pick that up and, and, and realize, uh, you know, how to deliver their pieces. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, the, um, you know, in LA, where there's probably a bunch and tons of open mics, and, you know, a lot of people probably feel like celebrities, and, um, you know, I can see how, like, limiting that until people can do the studying and the craft, yeah. and then, you know, bring bring your best piece, bring your best work that you, you've worked on a while um, to get on the mic. Out here, uh, our mic opportunity is a little bit more limited. We don't have very many open mics. Um, and so to for this region, I'm like, how can we grow it? How we, can we get young people more involved um, to to host? Because we the few that we did, you know, we lost during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, we'll people need a, a, an outlet to express. So, you know, how do we build that for them? Mm -hmm. uh, and what that looks like. But I do want to go to the next question, which was touched on a little bit. You know, what suggestions would you have for someone that, you know, was interested in being, becoming Poet Laureate? Um, what type of work do you think they should be engaging in, uh, you know, to be, to be working towards that role? Well, I don't think you should be working toward the role, personally. I think you should be writing your work. I think you should be studying. I think you should be a part of the community. Um, I do, I think, uh, well, I, I would say that if you love the art form, then, you know, keep your antenna up mm -hmm. and you may be at a point in your life uh, or maybe uh, there's a wonderful, uh, you know, cr cross, uh, cross, uh, cross sections of opportunities like you were describing earlier or Antonio where you sort of like to stay available for stuff um, but I think that if you're as I say the same thing about the laureate quest as the book quest uh, anything uh, this is not necessarily about products although it is I'm holding books here obviously where you know you want to produce work that you can get published and you want to sell your books. So I don't think it's sort of either, either or uh, fundamentally, but I do think that if you are, uh, you know, whether it's a culturally specific community, member of a, a culturally uh, specific community or, you know, a stylistic community or whatever, you know, and, and so for me, the Southern California region, which is where I moved in 1991, I, what I do is observe how dimensional the community is. And, and for me, that means that I know that at any given time, not only is, are there open mics, you can go from the outest poetry, like something, something written by Will Alexander, for example, uh, who was just shortlisted for the Pulitzer, but if you, as a rule, read his work, you might not understand anything from page to page because of his approach stylistically and ideologically to the work. But you can go from somebody like him all the way into sl slams. And, you know, even somebody like Amanda Gorman, when she studied, uh, you know, she studied at Beyond Baroque. Uh, she worked hard. And you know, who knows why why somebody gets called from the vice president's, I mean from the president's office or the president's spouse's office. That's just, you know, those, you you can't predict stuff like that anyway. Um right. yeah, you just gotta be ready, and she certainly was. Um so I think that the, the more important uh question for me, uh, Mr. Coates, is you know, how do you get ready? You know what I mean? So can you open up your books five, seven years later and, and say, oh, I, I would read this poem in public right now because you put that time in, you put that craft in, you know, you put that love in, you know, 
you, you can see the homework you did. You can see the reading you've done. Uh, and I, I frankly think that that is a, I mean, that's what's going to keep, it certainly has kept me doing this since the 70s. You know, uh, I never thought I'd be writing a poem in, you know, in my 60s. I never thought I would be publishing books in my 60s. Um, because the people who were my teachers simply said, try to become a poet. Don't try to be known as a poet. And that was super, super impressive to me. And honestly, it's not, the, it doesn't lead to a lot of visibility on, on, a very, on a big level. It just means your shit is good <laughs> when it's time. So I told, it, for example, the laureate committee when they interviewed us, I said, look, they said, well, what does it mean to be, what, what would it mean to you to be the poet laureate of Altadena? I said, well, it would be an opportunity for me to honor the work honor the library system but beyond that it wouldn't mean much at all frankly it just means i'm that's another thing that I, that my work has presented to me i said because my main thing is cultivation of capacity of depth and dimension in the world um so anyway i you know i don't know if that is for me the question that has driven me at all is i never thought of you know what I mean? I did apply for other laureates, some California laureate. I mean, I never applied for the L.A. laureate. Um, I just felt like, I also think on principle, it's not even really what you should do. I think lead, arts leadership should do their homework, and they should be actually canvassing the community by, and finding out who should be measuring up to that kind of a stuff. I think it's a tad bit unseemly to be actually applying to be a lawyer. And frankly, had I known my job was volunteer, I probably wouldn't have done it either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a similar answer because when I think about Lynn Thompson, for example, like Lynn Thompson, you can't give her a title. She already is the poet laureate. Like it's like LA couldn't give her a title, you know? And so it's like, it's an honor. But like, it's really part of who she is, is generous. And part in generosity is embedded in like, if you're gonna be a poet laureate, like the, their heart is generosity. The heart of it is, is love for the work, loving a work that has given something to you that you, that is immeasurable and then being generous with that gift. And that's, and so I think that that's kind of when I think about like, preparation it a lot of it really is thinking about like do you love it like do, do you love words do you love poems do you love people our poem our poems is a vehicle to like get closer to people you know so those are the questions that i think any aspiring laureate or anyone who's interested in like creating opportunities and workshops for people you know should kind of think about because it's not you know, it's not a position that is, you know, outside of maybe very few of the lawyer positions, well-funded or funded to the capacity that of the work that you're doing. But I think for me, for instance, like their requirement was that I do five readings a year or five events a year. I'm like, I'm going to do 10. I did 10 last year with or without the title of laureate. So I think that like, like a lot of the things that, you know, folks in charge who are creating these positions or doing the applications, like it is a, it was a moment of reflection for me. So it gave, it gave me an opportunity to think about what have I been doing, but it wouldn't have, if I started from a place of saying, I want to be laureate, so I need to do a workshop in San Bernardino, I need to do a workshop in LA, I need to do a workshop, that, I think that would have been the wrong path. You know, something about that would feel like not quite wouldn't sit well with me. So I, I do think, I think the nature of the lawyer position is one or should be one where it's like, of course, yeah. Like, Lynn, yeah, like, yeah, easy. You know, like someone who's already doing the work of laureate, essentially, and then they get, you know, the honor or the, or the, or the opportunity. Gotcha. Yeah, so no shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I didn't, I was encouraged to apply um, and when the deadline was coming 
I received another email saying, Antonio, the deadline is coming. Mm -hmm. We got, we don't have your entry yet. Mm -hmm. And so those art people were, were canvassing and they were, um, I didn't realize that till afterwards. Um, but the, the day of the event, uh, when they were gonna announce the Port Laureate, I showed up at, at it was the University of Puget Sound, full house of people. I was stressed. And I came, I had a headache. And I came into the door and I sat in the very last seat right next to the door so I can make a quick escape. Uh, and the, there were other poets and they were published. I, I, I wasn't published, still not published, uh, have a book. Um, and uh, I'm sitting there and they're behind the podium and they're reciting and reading from their own books. And I'm like, wow, you know, I don't got a shot. But something hit me, <laughs> something hit me, and I'm sitting in the back, and I tell you, I'm influenced by hip hop, so Buster Rhymes, right? Buster Rhymes, very out there, very outside the box. And when they announced my name, I started from my seat. And I said, sometimes I feel like Buster. And I'd be like, y'all, y'all, y'all. And so I'm walking to the stage reciting Buster Rhymes, and when I reached the stage, I, I started, and I was named Poet Laureate. I didn't, I, was I the best poet? Uh, no, but I believed I was. At that moment when, when the opportunity was there, I was like, okay, these people are reading out of their own books. I gotta pull something out. <laughs> and it, what, what, what happened was in my spirit to go, to go big or go home. And so uh, my performances, I think, uh, was uh, the key. Uh, and. And I was like that at bus stops, at universities, at uh, house parties, at, you know, it was the same level of energy that I would recite my poems in. And a lot of times it's to, to, to teach, you know, if you're gonna get on the mic, you know, don't waste the mic time, you know? And uh, you have something to say. It doesn't even have to be the best poem, but the delivery has to, has to you know, push me back in my chair. And uh, uh, that's what I love about the art of words, and you know, you know, the world was created right with words. So I, uh, I'm really uh, passionate about that part of it. Thank you. Yeah. So like, yeah, I might just say something to that. I think that what you just said for me is exciting because there's different kinds of IQs, there's different kinds of literacies. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, there's different kind of influences on various aspects of the art form. So, so I'm from the world stage in, in Los Angeles. That's my briar patch. I started going to the world stage two years after it was founded, 1989, when it was founded. And I remember when we began to our workshop began to get richer and deeper. And so we were, we were able to, to hear a, a writer maybe try to do some sort of elementary school in rhymes. And I certainly, this is back in the 90s, and I, you know, right around the corner was a Project Blowed with Ben Caldwell at the Chaos Network, where, you know, sort of seminal <laughs> hip hop folks were coming together and inventing a sort of a LA I'm not a hip hop head, so I don't want to act like I am. But I do want to say this. I think what 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 has to be acknowledged about hip hop is the literal, like nuclear rearrangement of language. Yes. Um, and of course, since I'm from the 70s, so much of that music that was sampled anyway was my stuff I grew up on, so I just kind of grew with it. Uh, even if I don't know all of Buster Rhymes' work or whatever, whoever's, but I think that's what was exciting. I remember we would feed back to the writers. Well, it's too late now. Langston is gone, and you can't do a poem with easy going in rhymes anymore, or else you're not taking advantage of what younger people are giving you, and furthermore, you're not respecting the evolution of the art form. 
which has always included, the black literary tradition has always included so-called spoken word, mm -hmm. uh, oral traditions, etc. So I think there's, you know, so, so if anybody suggests that just because your main focus is oral presentation, that you aren't up to people who have put stuff in books, they're not, they're being ahistorical and disingenuous. At the same time, I would challenge my younger hip hop heads from back. This is all, you know, I was in my 40s then, but you know, I had been around people like Lucille Clifton. These are people who were like neighbors when I was a kid. And I would remember telling the young people, okay, okay, now you have this gift, this boldness, um, this sort of uh, 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 sort of literal, you know, <laughs> centrifuge, spinning yeah. all the time, yeah. where language is just flying around and it's keeping you, when the floor drops out, you don't fall because it's just that powerful. Yeah, like that. Yet, don't think that's enough right. by itself. Do your homework. You should know everybody from Phyllis Wheatley, whose work I could, I don't personally find interesting because I know, but I want to know the history and I want to know the political framework that had her literally being taken in front of people to sort of testify that she actually wrote the work. So you got to know the tradition because it's all about literacy and freedom. And that's how I avoid the easy debates about Spoken word or the printed word. Right. That's not a debate. That's not a debate. Not in the black community. You know? So, anyway, so to me, you know, this has nothing to do literally with laureate work on one level. Because nobody comes to hear, you know, Angela and them on Tuesday worrying about Peter's philosophical sort of underpinnings. But, you get to show the rain. That's what I mean by being dimensional about this stuff. You know, this is very complex cultural work. If you just focus on poetry alone, let alone how poetry sits with music or interacts with music, etc. So I just like that. You know, you know. Actually, I'm really curious. So, so you you didn't apply. It sounds like. Oh, I did. But did you know that they was looking at you or did no. you? Okay. Interesting. And who did you apply to? It was to Liberal Field. Oh, what's her name again? Sarah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think they had a panel. Okay, gotcha. That is good. And you're the poet laureate of the whole county. Yeah. Good Lord. That's incredible. <laughs> do they pay? $500. What? <laughs> you do have a gig, no, though, so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, well, that's a very a small amount. I didn't know. Peter, I, I like what you were saying about the um, the work and like I and and the, the tradition, right? Like I I feel like a lot of people um, don't go back and, and do that work of learning how we got here. Mm -hmm. um, they may like contemporary work, work of poets and be like that seems cool. They're on stage, a lot of people up there, um, and there's a lot of flashy slam like entertainment type events and stuff uh, but a lot of the work is done going back again and seeing uh, what people like Phyllis Sweetly wrote about and Langston and all those generations um, studying right mm -hmm. studying the history of poetry before you start claiming it is like you know, I'm going to reinvent something, or I'm, you know, I'm the best. You've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I do want to jump into the part about books, because we're running out of time. And so um, we're all aware there's been an effort, conservative effort, to ban books in, uh, across America in libraries uh, and in classrooms. Uh, most of these books uh, that are being challenged focus on communities of color, uh, history of racism, and uh, LGBTQIA um, characters in these texts. Um, so I just want to give us time to maybe talk about uh, maybe the dangers 
the the banning of books present? I know we have we've seen it in history, but um, maybe the, uh, the the why that would be harmful, problematic to the actual community that they claim to be interested in helping, and then ways that poetry can speak for from those communities and um, and offer representation to to the individuals in those communities? Well, first, book banning, book burning is wrong, period. I mean, there's no way around it. Let's just get, for me, I'm going to get right to the crux of it. It is a representation of a lack of imagination. Uh, it's a representation of a certain community of folk uh, having a certain amount of power, administrative power is really what it is. Because if you have to ban a book, uh, that means you're not really dedicated to education, uh, period. If you think that you can stand at a, at, a, at a school board meeting and quote Jesus saying, that's why I'm getting rid of, I want to get rid of Tony Morrison's Song of Solomon or whatever the case may be. Well, that's not education, that's indoctrination. It's a dogmatism, uh, it's laziness, um, and, you know, it, it, at this point in, in, in my adult life, observing stuff like this, uh, this has become what uh, Francis Welsing used to call an actual psychiatric disease, that people are literally afraid of actual history, period, uh, whether it's... Uh, the scientists or anybody. In fact, I, I, I call it whitelessness. It's literally a, a, a psychological state in which you convince yourself that you are the center of everything and you don't have to engage with anybody else. That is a colonialist mentality. It is a mentality that literally leads to genocide and has. And if you burn a book, you know, and that's not even a new technique. That happened when the Spaniards came over. They literally burned a book. And if it wasn't for indigenous folk, uh, you know, the same people who were building missions and whatnot, if it weren't for them t taking the time to document their cultures, with each page being burnt, a whole epoch or a whole era would be destroyed. So I think it's important. So for me as a laureate and as an active cultural worker, you come to me and say a book should be banned, you won't be in trouble. It's just that simple. I don't, I don't accommodate it. Uh, you know, I don't, it's not even necessary to call out a particular uh, a social uh, organization or government or movement in the past, Nazism or whatever. You don't have, you don't even have, it's what people with power do. They don't want to engage with the people over which they have power. And that's why black people weren't allowed to read except through threat of death. And I think if we take it as a life and death matter, we will fight all the time. And it's not because our favorite author's book is targeted. It's not because of no, she won the Nobel Prize or the Pulitzer Prize. It's because on principle, banning a book means you don't want people to be educated. And to me, I break it down that elementally so that we don't bullshit with it. Because if you start trying to accommodate people, uh, like Trump or like, uh, or, you know, Ron DeSantis or whoever's out here, for, for God's sake. I have no, I'm sure there are people out here who want to ban books or burn them. Y'all live out here. I don't. California may have a veneer of liberalism, but you can, all you got to do is turn left on such and such street. And next thing you know, you like, what? You know, so I take this stuff very seriously. And I know that at the library, you know, our librarian uh, uh, and district director, you know, very serious about open, the, you know, the, the, the open, uh, making sure that there's an open 
purchase pro, pro, uh, policy, you know, um, a diverse, uh, you know, batch of books in the shelves, etc. So to me, banning books, burning books, life and death. I'm on the side of life. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Natalie? Yeah, I'll say quickly, I think um, for me, that I was thinking about, I, I'm not interested in the work or strategy of my enemies. Like, I'm very interested in building up myself and my people. So I think like, yeah, like, I want to see, I want to help, you know, my son and, you know, kids like him and, you know, teenagers to be curious and critical and creative, you know, because if you can't burn that, you can't destroy that. That's the bigger thing. And I don't believe that folks who are interested in burning books are smart enough to know which ones to burn or which ones to ban. There's too many good ideas out there that haven't been targeted. And people who are doing these things are not doing them from a deep understanding of the book and knowing what they're doing it because someone mentioned it on a TV show or someone um, gave them a clip, you know, in a, an organization they were in. So they don't know that, you know, if you ban this, then you're going to need to ban, you know, that and that and that and that. And they don't understand the connections. Like, Toni Morrison is a Southern Gothic writer as well as a modernist. Like you can't, you might say, oh, she's a black woman and then you get scared and then the things she's saying, then you ban her. But then you realize she's in a whole world of writers who don't look like her. And so she's in conversation with them. And so you only know that if you're critical about the work and you think about the work and you love the work. So my, I mean, in addition to like having physical copies of all the authors that I love and I think are like vital authors, um, if the worst should happen, you know, that you can't access them, but I think that's possible. You know, um, I really want to focus on what do I want to build and not be caught in this like yeah. unending cycle of, you know, crisis yeah. and response. And, you know, that's so um, exhausting. And I think that, like, that's part of the work. You know, Tony Morrison always talking about, like, the fundamental vital purpose of racism is distraction. As long as we stay distracted, we don't do any work. And so I think that, like, those sort of antics are really, like, destabilizing. And a lot of times, like, I don't have an unending, like, fount of energy to, like, fight against what book this library wants to ban. When I can get that book, I had that book already. I read that book. If I don't have a copy, I can remember it and tell, you know, because we're going to, I mean, part of the oral tradition that you mentioned, like, we might have to tell stories to our children and to our families and to our people and record them. There are other ways to move through the world. And to me, that sort of like, that like hammer of power. When people think, I'm going to just like grind you. I'm going to erase you. It's erasure. Like you mentioned that in your question, like, you can't erase the memory of people who are so much bigger than this moment. Like this is a very like childish moment. I think about, you know, in a lot of our politics, but it's like, we remember, <laughs> like, we remember, like we memorize, we, we, we have access to things that are bigger than whatever folks feel energized to ban in one particular moment or instance. Thank you for that. Antonio? Yeah. Um, I want to thank you because, uh, um, when you invited me, um, uh, I started to to think about it. I had knee jerk reactions at first, and then I started to research, and and it reminded me of of course of slavery first, and and then it took me to uh, parental advisory stickers mm -hmm. on on music. Um, it just kept you know one thing just kept connecting to another, and and how this has been going on and. Then I went in, I was uh, reading about how they ban and burn books in other countries uh, for their religious beliefs and, and how they erase that. And I concluded after all that, and I lost sleep. I was, I was up last night like, man, this is like huge, right? And uh, the First Amendment, right? Freedom, right? Uh, it came to me that free, with freedom, there's responsibility. So it isn't that I'm free to write and print and say anything I want. I have the freedom to fight for it, to fight for it because somebody's going to disagree. And I have the freedom 
to fight for it through the government, through the laws. I have the right in that sense. Um, because if, if I'm writing a piece of material, I have to take the responsibility of somebody disagreeing with that. I have to know that. And I don't think that always happens. I just writing what I feel. And, but if I'm putting it out there, um, somebody's going to disagree with it. So I have the freedom and the, uh, to fight for that. Uh, cause they're going to have, and, and they're going to uh, fight me back for their beliefs and their opinions about it and their goals, you know, then that's when we have to get the courts in like, um, the two live crew, uh, I, I looked that up and how they, how they won their, their case, uh, where they said the music was obscene and it is right. But the court said that it wasn't, it was artistic, uh, freedom. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Cause, uh, they have the right and they fought for that right to to do that. Um, it's gonna be pushback. Uh, I've been wanting to write a book and it's still, you know, rolling around in my head as an adult male who was sexually abused as a child. Now, after researching this, I was like, wow, is my book gonna be banned? Because it's gonna talk about sex and, and incest and, and things like that that are taboo um, um, and that people don't wanna talk about. And I was like, wow, do, am I going to censor myself now? Yeah. Am I going to, you know, uh, or am I going to write the book? And because my, my spirit tells me that I want to help someone else who's, who's suffering in silence. Uh, I'm bold enough to say it and, and write about it and try to help. That's my goal is to help someone who may be suffering. But am I going to uh, uh, have to uh, censor myself and, and worry about it being banned? Um, now I, I know I'm a, I will have to uh, think about it uh, uh, as far as being banned. So um, uh, it's the freedom is the, the fight. I have the freedom to fight for what I believe in. If you wrote a book about you know the LGBTQ, you have now that's uh, not everyone agrees with that. So the freedom you have is to fight for your right to put that in print and and have that distributed. Uh, uh, freedom isn't free. Freedom isn't free. It's, it, you know, like you said, it has the, the illusion, mm -hmm. right? We have the illusion of freedom, but, uh, you know, I have to fight for it. Uh, my ancestors had to fight for it at every turn. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, when I researched, it said these books are said to be banned, a lack of literacy merit, a literary, lack of literary, literary merit, sorry. Literary merit, and uh, because they talk about situations like rape and, and, and police brutality and trauma. One book was banned because of the trauma uh, uh, after 9-11. Another book I, I, I saw, um, Dear, Dear Dr. King, um, Dear Martin, a young girl, right? Black girl, school student. Uh, she, asked, she, she wrote a book of asking Dr. King what he would do in a certain situation, she had an experience with some white police officers. Mm -hmm. So why would that be banned? Now, I would read that, but because it's on the ban list, now she has to fight. She has to fight, and she has the freedom to fight to get her story told and said. So that's why I think about the whole thing. Um, you know, write what you want to write, um, uh, express the way, but be prepared to know that somebody's gonna, uh, uh, you're gonna get pushed back, somebody's gonna have another opinion, mm -hmm. and your freedom lies in your fight to say what you wanna say. Um, it's been done in the courts, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, on and on in history. Uh, and they had to fight, nothing was given to them. So, uh, and, and me writing my book, uh, uh, if, it, if it gets pushed back, I'm gonna have to fight. Uh, because my goal is to help other 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 people who are suffering uh, in silence and don't have a voice. Thank you, thank you for that um, bringing that information in. Because yeah, we didn't talk about it's First Amendment right that the, the, they're trying to limit, you know, and, and the ideas that they're scared of that are in those books. Um, so we're we're running out of time. We only got a few minutes left. Uh, Y'all brought poems to share. We got about three minutes a piece. Would you like to share a poem? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. What if you read so many books that Google begins to ask you random questions? 
that you become the foremost authority of all things that speak life? What if you create literature that adds new words to the world's vocabulary, multiplies our libraries and places books into hands that never held them, in front of the eyes of those who never seen a printed word before? What if for every page you read, a seed is planted that grows into another tree, providing oxygen for all living things to breathe, that those unfamiliar words begin to articulate their meaning in your own voice, leaving you no choice but to remember them? What if reading becomes as natural to you as breathing, as fulfilling to you as eating, and takes you places your imagination can never conceive on its own? What if you read in your sleep, transforming your dreams into characters and events the world have not yet seen, that you begin to write poetry that changes curriculums, challenges disciplines, and uses words in ways that unites humankind. I like to teach the world to write poetic harmonies. I hope they hold them in their hearts and keep them company. What if the words you write are read like musical notes used to compose phonetic symphonies that you begin reading the stars and far off galaxies and discover the one to be named after you? You see, I like to teach kindergartners how to write haiku in crayon so they can go home and turn their refrigerated doors into poetic art galleries. I like to teach a seventh grader if they could only read the 3.2 billion characters in their DNA, they'll never again see themselves as ordinary. You see, reading and identifying words in print is what we call word recognition. Uh, understand, getting an understanding, constructing an understanding from them is what we call comprehension. Uh, let me see. Hold on. That part I didn't know. I'll start that. Reading and identifying words in print is what we call word recognition. Constructing an understanding from them is what we call comprehension. Coordinating words so that reading is automatic and accurate is a mastery called fluency. So since the brain is a muscle, then reading are like steroids for the brain. And it has been said that those who read more are generally smarter than those who read less. So in the words of the great writer and philosopher, Dr. Seuss, the more you read, the more you know. The more you learn, the more places you'll go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, go. What's love for Tina? They speak of her body, her muscular and majestic legs, her dance across the stage as a curve of water cutting down a mountain or dewy forest air vibrating and glistening with morning or a thudding heart pulsing slick and electric. The heart, the fist end of a boxing glove, muscle woven over muscle, each stratum complex. This one patterned with curved and swirled ridges, a figure eight flourish of fibrous ribbon. That one smooth as grape skin. Flex, open, flex, close. The heart's shuddering pulse, messy and persistent. Our bodies, rivers, thrum, rhythms we can't hear. Love's too thin to hold us, dear. Of course the heart has three layers. Of course it's a muscle working all day, all night, in the dark. I have her voice close. I hear her say, we never do anything easy. Thank you, thank you. That is a, that is a love poem. You write a love poem. Uh, um, what's it called? Uh, resolution. Resolution dawns like Frankie Beverly's golden time of day. I am excited to bear what comes with peace. From within the sensuous maze of my vocal cords, wind summons congregation I can call my home. All right. 
Thank you. Um, so we appreciate you all being here today to join us with the conversation. Hopefully you learned a little bit about um, what it means to be a poet laureate, the, the deep cultural work that uh, these individuals are engaged in um, every day we are prior to getting that um, title and during having that title, trying to build community and even after the, the work that continues to go on. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Landia. Oh, anyone have a question? Uh, we got we got time for maybe one or two. Um, thank you. Thank you for putting this on. I'm grateful. Um, I just want to say congratulations on being poet laureates. I um, I just got out of church and I, I knew about this. I wanted to come church randomly. I apologize for being late, but um, I am. I am in awe of your tenacity to, to, to be a poet and to do it and just to speak to speak for others that don't have a word, that don't have a way of speaking. Poetry is not be, is being able to say things that cannot be said, and I I I admire you guys. And I and I I don't know your work. I apologize, but I do admire you for being poet laureates, and I thank you. Um, my question is, <clears throat> when you have a story. Or I have a poem inside. How do you not do it for the audience? How do you do it for yourself so that it'll move the audience, but you're not doing it so that you can get the clicks or the likes? How do you do it so that you can do it for you? Um, I always consider the audience, the listener. Someone told me your poems are not for you, they're for the hearer of your poem. So I'm always considering not for the, if you like it or not, but I want you to hear it. And because that's what God gave it to me for, for the hearer. You know, I'm the vessel. And so my poems are, 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 are if they feel good to me, some people will tell me, well, you know, they will critique my poem. I'm like, you know, uh, can't critique it. You know, no one can critique a poem. And uh, uh, if it feels good to me and it moves me, I know it's going to move you because we're made up of the same stuff. Another question? Yeah, I do want to say you are your own audience first, yes. and you should be, and you should develop your own standards. Uh, at the same time, if you go public with it, uh, I think, Antonio, you might have suggested this. Uh, so one, you gotta be prepared that people might not understand it or might not like it or what have you. So uh, I, I would say just as a fellow panelist, uh, that for the record, I believe all poems can be critiqued. Uh, in fact, I used to yell at people at the stage and say, if you say your poem is from God, then edit God. Because <laughs> it's just you and language. And so I think, it, but it's that, it's not the time to do it now so much as on principle. I just want to make sure yeah. I can't co-sign something I don't co-sign. But uh, anyway, so thank you, uh, you know. And remember how difficult it is. And really, I really love the difficulty of it. Mm -hmm. All right, we got another question here? Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, um, so my question is, um, so when I write, I write like my feelings. Is that is that something like like a poem? Because like whatever I feel, I just grab my like my notebook. And I start start writing di different stuff. You know, so you can develop that into a poem. I mean, it's a poem. You know, writing. You know, my poems I wrote were I called some of them prayers. They were my prayers, and, and, and I recite them as poetry because that's what the masses call it. But in me, if your feelings are definitely poetic, you can write them down and share them. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I think it's about time to finish, but I'd love to hear a couple more questions. And I want to remind you, we have some snacks <laughs> as well as books. Snacks. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for your questions. Um, there are books uh, on the table outside, so if you're interested in getting to know some of the author's work, 
um, definitely check them out and uh, you know talk to them, tell them what you thought about uh, the responses and the, the answers. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Right. Thank you, James. Thank you all for being here. That was fun.